and welcome back to Three Q's and You. I'm your host, Hank Rawls, and this is the show where we get to choose one of our favorite teachers here at Boise State, and we get to bring them on and harass them on camera. <laughs> and today, I have brought on my favorite UF200 instructor, Dane Johns. Thanks for having me, Hank. Oh, thanks for coming out. Absolutely. So, uh, would you want to tell some people about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Dean Johns. I'm a UF 200 instructor as well as the Associate Coordinator for Proctoring and Certification Services. Uh, it's one of the arms of the testing center. Uh, I've been uh, associated with Boise State since I came here as a junior in college in 2005. And I've been teaching in the UF program first as a grad student starting in 2014 and then as a graduate in 2018. All right. And, and uh, would you mind refreshing my memory? What was the UF 200 course uh, that yeah, I was in? Yeah, absolutely. So I teach, I have two versions of it. The one you okay. took is uh, called Super Ethics. And I found that the, the heavy topics we have to talk about in UF 200, uh, some of the really serious ethical and diversity issues are really a lot easier for students to engage with if they get to talk about it in an effective way. And so uh, the class you got to take is all based around superheroes uh, with a heavy emphasis on Stanley's X-Men. And then my new version, which is for honor students, uh, is all based around Star Wars Ooh. and has a heavy focus on political violence and the death of democracy. Ah, a very heavy subject right there following the word Star Wars. Yes. Uh, and whose lightsaber is that? Uh, this is Ayla Sakura. She's my favorite Jedi. Okay. She uh, is a prequel in Clone Wars era Jedi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's pretty sick right there. Thanks, man. I think getting tattoos of cool things is always a cool choice. Well, yeah. You know? I'm all about it. I would also like to say, uh, if anybody's out there needing to take UF 200, I would highly recommend this course, because it was the most interactive class that I think I've ever had. And boatloads of fun. I do have a, I have a section of each in the fall, so if people are looking for classes, uh, they can join me uh, this coming fall, either, you know, if they're not an honor student, they can join the comics class, and if they are, they can join the Star Wars class. Hell yeah, that's what we like to hear. Yep. That's what we like to hear. Uh, well, so, the way this show works, for everyone, in case this is your first show, maybe second, you it's your first, hopefully. All right, we have three sets of questions. All right. We have three categories. Okay. Each category has three questions. I'm on a game show, got it. Heck yeah, you are. <laughs> you win absolutely nothing. Perfect. You win a cool man's company. It's not mine, but he's backstage. How about a high five? Oh yeah, you okay. can get that too. Okay. If I win, I get a crisp high five. Oh yeah. Okay. All right, so we're gonna jump right into this. You get three questions, you get to choose one of these bad boys. Okay. There are also three teams. There's white, orange, and blue. Ooh, all right. And who's, whichever team you choose the most questions from, okay. they win bragging rights. All right. Oh, there's bragging rights. It's high line. stakes. That's high stakes. All right. Are you ready for this? These I am three ready. are pretty personal. Okay. Let's do it. All right. First one. What aspect of Bellegarth do you enjoy the most? Okay. How well did the debate team prepare you for life? Okay. And what is your favorite airsoft game mode and why? Ooh. As much as I love my hobbies, mm -hmm. uh, Bellegarth and Airsoft, I think I'm going to answer the debate question. Okay. Uh, I think that, uh, so for, for the audience, I was a competitive debater in high school and a state champion. Uh, and then I debated for both CSI and Boise State University as an undergrad. And Something you probably remember from my class is I put a high premium on public speaking, and I think that it's really mm -hmm. important for students to learn how to articulate their ideas in a way that doesn't make, you know, that doesn't give them nerves. And, and one of the things mm -hmm. I tell my students is someday public speaking is going to be the difference between what you have and what you want, uh, whether that's a job interview or a marriage proposal or trying to get your kids not to do drugs. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to hear a speech that starts, hi, my name is, and today we're going to talk about, because uh, no dad ever walks into their kid's room and says, hi, son, I'm dad, and today we're going to talk about heroin. The kid's already checked out. He's looking for <laughs> some drugs at that point. And so uh, the debate team, I think, prepared me in particular for, for being a teacher because I have to engage all of my students and in, in, in a, a big way a lot in all these philosophical conversations and with all these big uh, problems. And I have to be able to help them learn how to push back. 
And without having that debate training where I learned how to push back, I wouldn't be able to, to help my students turn into functional, engaged citizens. And so for prepping me for my whole life, I think that's probably the best experience I ever had was getting involved in a debate team. And, and it's really translated into being a teacher. Yeah. I think uh, I think that I think it's really helped you out. I think it really comes across in your classrooms that uh, you can speak well. I, I hope, yeah, I try, right? That's being yeah. dynamic and engaging and, and getting those sweet, sweet academic reviews and, and all those ra good ratings on Rate My Professor really, you know, really helps. Yeah, if you're not on Rate My Professor or uh, you know, you've never taken his class, uh, go on there, give him five stars, really high ratings, it doesn't matter what for, you can say something, <laughs> you can say something outlandish. Uh, that's uh, actually happened recently, check my rate. Check my radio <laughs> professor for an outlandish comment. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say if you wanted to plug anything. Uh, uh, that would be it, yeah, I guess. Radio. My, my, radio, my radio professor page is really good. It's really popping off. Yeah, right it's, 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 it's blowing up. Um, I do also, I do want to clarify what the Belagarth is. Yeah, uh, oh, so Belagarth is, is a, a foam uh, fighting slash LARPing game that I've been a part of since uh, 2002. And okay. so I'm, you know, I'm in my 20th year of my career. Uh, it, it's uh, not quite the um, fireball, fireball, fireball uh, role models style LARPing you'd see in the movies uh, or even in you know, the Supernatural episode with Felicia Day. It's much closer to um, medieval reenactment but with foam padded weapons. And uh, yeah, I've been a sword fighter since 2002 and I got knighted in that organization in 08. Uh, and I've won multiple national championships, uh, both individually and as a team. And yeah, it's, it's super fun. Uh, the local chapter here just started meeting again now that it's warm enough. And we meet right across the river from Boise State over in uh, Julia Davis Park, uh, down by where Whole Foods, Whole Foods is. Oh, okay. Uh, so if anybody wants to join, they can- uh... Swing by, we have plenty of loaner gear. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. That's, I might be stopping by. <laughs> Come, come get I'm your not good, I'll get hit immediately. Yeah, come get your sword on. Yes. <laughs> um, and then also with the uh, Airsoft, yeah. figure maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. We got some photos, if you don't mind sure, us yeah, pulling these bad up. boys up. Yeah. All right. Uh, so would you mind telling us a little bit about like kind of what got in, what got you into airsoft? What, uh, yeah, so this, this photo is actually of my, one of my best friends, Ben Blake. He's my emotional support Marine. Uh, <laughs> he's a sergeant in the Marine Corps. He and I started airsofting together a little over 10 years ago. And um, I actually, what's funny is a sword fighting friend of mine said, hey, I came and did your sword game. You come do my gun game. And so I was like, sure, I'll come try airsoft. And uh, I went out to my first airsoft uh, game out uh, in Oregon and had a great time and uh, came back and, and got a couple of my friends together, including Ben and, and uh, my sister, um, uh, my wife now plays. Uh, and we have like a 25 member team here in town. Uh, Airsoft has a long history here in Boise. There's two or three different communities. There's been big Airsoft here for like 20 years now. Uh, and we play all over uh, everything from, uh, there's an actual Airsoft field we've been building um, uh, in behind the Boise Stage Stop. Oh, this sweet. picture is from a major Airsoft event uh, held in Washington, uh, in Centerville, Washington. And it's held by a company called Milsim West. And Milsim West has an ongoing story and the story, what's funny, is right before Russia actually invaded Crimea, Josh Warren, who owns the company, who's a former uh, army ranger, said, okay, what's a fictional event that's never gonna happen? I know, Russia invading Ukraine. And so he created this fictional event that put NATO troops against Russian troops, and three months later, after their first event, Russia actually invaded Crimea. And that was what the first, very first game was set up. But so since then, it's that's been the theme. Uh, we're set to go back to our next event in uh, in over Memorial Day, and so we're uh, hopefully, hopefully the current events haven't taken too much of the fun out of it. Um, but we'll we'll see. Should people start taking uh, kind of what this airsoft event is doing as more of like an oracle situation? Ooh, where they're like, man. Ooh. Uh, it, it, it definitely feels a little prophetic, <laughs> but uh, I hope not. I hope this is just fun and that the, the just pure coincidence. Pure coincidence. That? Otherwise, Josh Warren can see the future, and I I gotta ask him about some lotto numbers. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, you ready to move on to our college slash professional section? Let's do it. All right. All right. First, oh, I, I also failed to say which one of the teams won, and it was orange. Orange team won. 
Perfect. Put that down, <laughs> producer or director. <laughs> I put the cards weird again. <laughs> All right, never mind, no I didn't. Uh, back onto the questions. Sure. First one, how did you realize that you wanted to work in higher education with college students? Okay. What made you pursue a master's in medieval history? Okay. Or was there a backup plan in medieval history if medieval history didn't work out? Ooh. I can go back over them if you'd like. No, so I, I, I I think I should, so the first question was, what made me want to work in higher ed with college students? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to choose that question. The other two have far too simpler answer, like a simple of answers uh. to, to let me elaborate. So, uh, so I choose the, the why, but I can answer you, no, there was no backup plan. <laughs> the getting into medieval history was my backup plan. I worked, uh, I mentioned that I worked, uh, uh, or maybe I didn't mention, I worked in, when I graduated with my undergrad, I worked at Wells Fargo for four years, and it, while giving me lots of money, kind of sucked my soul out a little bit, and ah. so my backup plan was to come back and actually get into, you know, a history profession somehow, some way, so that's, that's the quick answer there. Okay. What made me want to work with college students? Well, when I was in high school, my guidance counselor told me that I should either be an educator or a cult leader, and okay. that those were the only two things I would ever be good at. And I looked into starting a cult, it's really expensive. Land, especially in Montana, is too expensive for me to start like a legit cult. I think you're charismatic enough. I think I, you could get people I could, to give you the I money. I could probably get people to give me the money, but it seemed like a lot of work. Yeah. And so I, I decided I was gonna get back into education. And my mom taught second grade for you know 22 years. And so it's kind of in my blood. My cousin Kizzy is a teacher. And so I, I said I'm gonna do it, but I didn't think I could hack teaching high school kids because I swear too much. Uh, and any group of, if you're gonna teach history, it requires, I think, multiple uses of some words that get people's attention, and I, yeah. I didn't wanna have you know, somebody's mom in my classroom after dropping an F-bomb you know, getting chewed out, so yeah. that's what made me wanna work with college students. <laughs> uh, Boise State in particular is my alma mater. Right, it's where I went, it's where I graduated from, they gave me my first teaching job. Uh, Boise's my home. Uh, I had no plans to move to find another job. In fact, I stuck it out as an adjunct rather than go out and pursue full-time jobs at other institutions because I didn't want to move. So, um, you know, I got a lot of history here. I've lived here since, 20, since 05. Uh, this is my home and this is, this is where I wanted to work the whole time, so. Oh, okay. And what was the other yeah. question? I can give the quick answer. Uh, pursue a master's in midi, what made oh, you pursue the I'm master's? I'm a huge history nerd, as evidenced by all the sword fighting, and so that was just perfect. I also, on this St. Patrick's Day, I should mention, I'm, I'm Irish, but I don't really know my Irish heritage. Uh, I'm, I'm far more attached to my Scottish heritage, and as a eighth grader, I found out that I was descended from Robert the Bruce, which is, uh, character and Braveheart, although Braveheart's not very historically accurate, and uh, that got me hooked on wanting to do sword stuff for the rest of my life. And so, and I started sword fighting in in O2, and you know, I was like, hey, I do this as a hobby. It would be really cool to do as a profession, and it is. Okay. Uh, what type of weapon do you use in your? Uh... So I'm a primary sword and shield fighter, but I'm good with everything. Okay, yeah. it, like a uh, long sword or more just uh, like short so sword? So the sword that I use is modeled after what's called an arming sword, which is about 34 inches long. Okay. Yeah, it's what, it's what knights would typically use from horseback uh, during the era where sh big shields were common. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the sword fighting kits for Belagarth is, is just any culture that um, or even fantasy arc uh, trope that, that doesn't have gunpowder as its primary mode of, of battle. So we get kits modeled after ancient Greek and Roman warriors. After, there's even a kid who has like a Native American uh, Lakota Sioux kit that he fights in, because uh, he is Lakota. And so uh, it's kind of anything's on the table. So that's, and that's really like First Crusade era is really what I honed in on, so that's. Okay, yeah. now that's pretty sick right there. And uh, I had a question. I just don't really remember it. Yeah, it's something to do if with it, weapons. If I'm a very up, big fan of weapons. If I'm it pops awesome. up, I'll answer it. Okay. Yeah. It might come towards the end. But now, now we're onto the wild card. The wild card. Now we're onto this wacky wild card right here. And yet again, man, am I bad at remembering. You chose. I chose the why. The why. That was Team White. Oh man. That's right. Let's see if I can get a Team Blue question and that way no one will win. Yes. <laughs> now that's what we're going for now. Yeah. 
scorched earth, no one wins. Yes. <laughs> um, and so for these, we got, how would you describe your hug with Alan Richardson Ooh. and why was it so sweet? Ooh, okay. What was the most historically accurate medieval TV show that you've ever seen? Okay. Or which medieval weapon would you ride into battle with if given the opportunity? Ooh, okay. Well, for the for the TV show question, can I can I give you a movie instead? Yeah, yeah, we'll okay. go with yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna choose that question. Okay. Um, but I will say my hug with Alan Richardson was amazing. Uh, and I just felt so safe. He's a very big and strong guy. And uh, as a big guy myself, uh, I don't hug a lot of guys who are bigger and stronger than I am on a regular basis. My dad's smaller than I am. Uh, a couple of my best friends are about the same size as I am. Uh, and just getting hugged by this massive dude uh, whom I've admired for you know a decade or more uh, for being in a ton of shows that I, I like and then getting to meet him and, and talk to him and, and just the moment. Uh, I felt very safe, I think is how I would have to describe the hug. Just the energy. The yeah. Oh, it was great. <laughs> uh, and, the, and how it happened, too. I was wearing my Party at the Goat House shirt, which was from the Kickstarter for the Netflix movie um, uh, Fadland, which is the, the carry-on from Blue Mountain State, which is a show he was in. And when he saw that I was wearing it during the interview, he goes, oh, my God, did you back the Kickstarter? And I said, yes. And he goes, bro, you made my dream come true. <laughs> and he got up to give me a hug. And I was like, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got a sweet hug on stage. It just from, melted yeah, in his arms right there. Absolutely. And, and uh, just, you know, he's a, just a great guy. He, uh, you know, he's always super positive and his Instagram stories are always, you know, kind of all about people chasing their dreams and, and yeah, he's a good dude. So mm -hmm. <laughs> the real question, what is the most accurate medieval movie and or TV show that I've seen? Yes. The answer to that question is called Outlaw King. Okay. Uh, Outlaw King is the most accurate medieval movie that's ever been made. It, it stars Chris Pine. It's by net. It's done by Netflix and it okay. is about Robert the Bruce. Uh, <laughs> what, there's a couple of really big things about Outlaw King that make it stand out. And, and the big one is that everyone's wearing colors. A big misconception about the medieval period is everything was brown, green, or gray, or, or you know, dirty, and that people didn't shower. Yeah. And you see all these bright colors, and uh, everybody's wearing, you know, period accurate stuff. The weapons are period accurate. They go so far as to have um, Longshanks' gigantic trebuchet that he had built called Warwolf. Uh, the castle he's sieging, and that, that actually happened in the, in, in, historically, is the castle they were sieging gave up when they saw it. <laughs> and he walks up and he goes, I didn't build this thing not to use it, and he does it, and he goes, now you can surrender. Now that I've used this gigantic trebuchet to eat this huge rock. Um, and, and there's just, there's tons of other stuff that's accurate. The, the Feast of the Swans, which had never been filmed ever on any production before, which is where Longshanks' son swears by the swans to, to take out Scott. Scotland, it's, there's so many good pieces. It's lit by candles at night instead of torches, which is what would have happened. Medieval tables would have had hundreds of candles on them instead of the sconce torches you see in movies. It, just all these little details are so accurate. That's Why candles and not torches? Well, torches drip. Oh, like okay. Like it's a torch on the wall. And, and a lot of medieval castles made out of stone, the tapestries you see are actually insulation. So oh, hanging okay. tapestries and rugs and stuff on the wall is a way to keep the winter chill out. And if you have torches next to them, you will light them on fire. Yeah. And so that's not good, obviously. And so instead, for dinners at night, uh, they would use candles, just tons of them along the table. Okay. And that would provide all the ambient light inside a castle. And so you see all these little things um, that are accurate. They got uh, uh, Black Douglas's coat of arms correct. It looks not entirely unlike an American flag, which is kind of funny, <laughs> but it's accurate and just so many things. The one big complaint people have about the movie is the final battle is actually something that happened a couple of years later and they just really compressed time for it. But it's, it's so well done. You can't fault them for that. Yeah, you know, you gotta, you gotta give up a little bit and... Yeah, I mean, anytime you're doing any Hollywood, you've gotta assume that something about it isn't gonna be accurate. Yeah. Uh, at least it wasn't a really big mistake, like, so Kingdom of Heaven, uh, starring Orlando Bloom. Balian of Ibelin's actually a coward, and he runs from the Battle of Hattin. <laughs> uh, he bails on all the Crusaders that get killed. In the movie, they have him go out after the Battle of Hattin and see everybody that's dead. He was there, he said, you know, F this, I'm out. He got his dudes and he bailed and went back to Jerusalem 
Jerusalem and left everybody to be massacred. Things like that are really big. A slight time compression mm. I can absolutely forgive. Yeah, definitely. Also, I got I to gotta agree with that guy who made the huge trebuchet. Yeah. Because I remember hearing about that story, and then immediately afterwards, like, you know, the first thought in your head is automatically like, oh, how horrible, they already surrendered. But then you're like, this guy spent so much time. Yeah. You know he was so excited to finally be like, I have an excuse yeah, it, to use this trebuchet, and then they're like, oh. It took months to build, so. Yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta yeah, you gotta, you gotta shoot it at least once, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah, for coming absolutely. on our show. My pleasure. Um, yeah, if you, uh, if you ever want to go airsofting sometime. Let's do it. Let's get you out there. All right. I'm definitely down. I can get a sword yep. uh, made out of very bad foam. Good foam. No. You want bad foam? Yeah. We'll do it. Okay. Right. There we go. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Three Q's and You, and I have been your host, Hank Rawls. Uh, once again, thank you, Dane, for yeah. joining us. My pleasure. And you guys have a wonderful night, a great evening, and some sweet dreams. Thank you.